Good evening, everyone, and welcome to MLA's Productivity and Profitability webinar series. These webinars are designed to deliver topics pertinent to beef, sheep, and goat producers. My name is Hilary, and I work for the webinar coordinators, Home Sackett. Tonight's webinar is our final webinar for this series, but not to worry, we'll be back later in the year. Remember that all webinars have been recorded and are available on the MLA website. Tonight's final presentation is by Dr. John Webware, discussing what you need to know when retaining older aged breeding use. Just a bit of housekeeping to begin with, this is the control panel that would be at the top right corner of your screen. The red arrow on the left collapses and reinstates the control panel. You should be able to hear us, but we cannot hear you. Please type your questions in the box provided. Please make these questions as succinct as possible, and I will relay them to John at the end of the webinar. Just to introduce our presenter tonight, um, most of you will be well aware of Dr. John Webware, who is a senior consultant at the University of the uh, University of Melbourne uh, at the McKinnon Project. He advises to sheep and beef producers in southern Australia on all aspects of farm management. John also presents regularly on to farming groups and is involved with various farm management and agricultural related committees. He also undertakes uh, teaching of veterinary and agriculture students at the University of Melbourne. John also runs a 6,000 DSE beef and sheep property on the Melbourne uh, fringes of Melbourne in partnership with his family. So a very warm welcome uh, again to John and I will make him the presenter. Thanks very much, Hilary. I was just put it on the slideshow. So thanks very much for the um, opportunity to present tonight. And yeah, just been on the fringes of Melbourne. That's all all about lockdowns now. So um, as long as the wind doesn't come up from the south, we'll be okay. But uh, so look, to um, tonight, it's it, I'm going to focus on talking. Uh, both with merino and prime lamb flocks um, and talking about many, uh, older ewes, the impact of retaining older ewes. And look, it's a pretty common theme. There's a lot of people in um, Australia have been running older flocks in recent years for various reasons, but and we'll go into some of them. But I guess to start off with, I just want to talk about the impact of um, um, uh, age on different traits uh, um, in your flock, um, and talk about the impact of age on on flock structure and profitability, and some other uh, management factors to go along with that. So it's it's a pretty um, straightforward um, webinar. This one, in terms of um, uh, what are we talking about? So uh, let's get into it. But to start with, why run more old ewes. I guess um, there's lots of reasons for it and a lot of um, uh, uh, very logical reasons uh, for it. I mean, obviously uh, the big one, which um, will impact on a lot of people over the next few years where they actually started running uh, or, or running lower stock numbers is uh, retaining more ewes to build up stock um, numbers to where they should be um, in the long long haul, um, and and so uh, that's that's going to be a, a the major uh, first port of call in terms of um, also the other thing which has been a, a longer term issue is the increasing proportion of um, uh, the the sheep flock joined to terminals and prime lamb production specifically talking merinos. Here, in terms of joining more to prime lamb production to capture uh, um, the higher prices, it obviously has an impact in into the specific age age structure of the um, uh, the, the retained merinos, and I'll go into that in a bit of details. 
a bit of detail. Obviously, another really important point is um, uh, which does lend itself to running more, retaining more older users when your enterprise is expanding, and 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 that that's actually um, uh, quite logical in most situations. Um, um, and then another one too, which I, I, uh, we see quite a lot of, is um, um, running a high proportion of um, younger years does have an impact on um, reproduction and uh, uh, productivity and profitability. So I'll, I'll talk about that. But there's a balance act between a balancing act there between younger years and older years. But uh, having a lot of younger years can have a, a an impact onto that uh, reproduct overall reproductive performance, but but I guess there's a lot of reasons for um, not buying um, the stock. One is price and and so on, but obviously there's um, the really important biosecurity issues: foot rot, lice, lesser degree OJD, drench resistant worms, which should be able to be managed. But they're all all pretty important reasons and. So uh, to take that biosecurity risk out rather than buying more replacements is retaining some older sheep. Um, and and the other thing too, I mean, is bloodline. If you've got a really good bloodline, particularly talking the merinos here, is is often uh, you can't buy what um, you've got in your own flock. Likewise, it can be the other way around too. Is that a lot of older um, older um, a lot of uh, uh, existing flocks aren't particularly good and better off buying replacements uh, uh, with a, a more productive bloodline. I guess um, um, all of these, uh, if you're going to be running older ewes, the, the, it will have an impact. Um, as ewes get old, and I'll show this in detail in a minute, is increasing um, uh, Re, um, uh, reproduction to a point, then it starts to drop off. Wool traits the same, uh, but particularly uh, a really important one is is the higher risk of um, uh, higher death rates in in older ewes. Um, some people argue uh, retaining older ewes for genetic improvement, but I, I think it's a bit of a fallacy that one in terms of. One of the key drivers of uh, the rate of genetic improvement is generation interval, and, and having a lot of older sheep is going to spread out that generation interval, and so actually slow down genetic improvement. But that's a whole different different topic. So, in terms of just talking about that issue with regard to how many ewes you can mate to terminals, and uh, this is in a merino flock, so your dual purpose type enterprise, and I've just given a um, uh, a scenario here with a model flock. Um, uh, this, um, and the assumptions are keeping used for five lambings, uh, when a death rate, um, uh, ten percent, so quite a high death rate. Uh, five percent of you hoggets are cold, and three percent um, adult death rate. So, and this table here shows you the um, uh, different lambing percentages in your merino to merino proportion of your flock. How many um, ewes as a percentage of the total numbers you can join to a terminal enterprise uh, whilst maintaining the um, uh, fl flock and age structure. And here we're running with five lambings, we're running ewes to seven years old. But it has a really big impact. If you're, say for example, got a lambing, uh, a weaning percentage of um, 80 per cent, uh, then the maximum 75 to 80 per cent, then the maximum proportion you can um, join to terminals and keep that age structure without having to either buy more sheep or run sheep to an old age, age again is uh, the maximum um, uh, is only about a third of the flock that you can join to terminals. But if you've got a 90 to 95 per cent lambing or weaning percentage in your, in your merinos, the, the maximum percentage to terminals uh, will, um, uh, you can uh, up to 45 to 50% uh, or, or thereabouts and retain that age structure. So it's really dependent on um, what your reproductive uh, performance is in your base merino flock. 
So, and, and what actually has happened in recent years, there's a lot of producers which have actually um, joined a higher proportion of their um, flock to terminals. Um, and so they've, they've ended up having either very old flock um, um, or having to buy additional ewes in to retain a sensible um, age structure. I just want to go through some of the traits with different age um, um, age uh, 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 structures. And uh, the first thing I want to talk about is um, the mortality rate um, in um, uh, use with different ages. Now, it's actually not a lot of recent data on this, but I, I, I found, I went and did a fairly comprehensive literature research and I looked back a fair way. And interestingly, if there was a uh, uh, with a very large set of data in New Zealand, it's 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 50 year or 60 years old, the the data now, but it, it still um, reflects the reality to to a, a large degree um, of the mortality rate with uh, uh, different age ewes, and you can see um, um, uh, um, that that it steadily increases, uh, particularly over six years old, and. You can see it, it becomes just uh, the death rates become un, uh, uh, catastrophic once uh, they're over eight, eight to nine years old. Um, and this was a compilation of mixed breeds, uh, predominantly, well, virtually all um, uh, meat type breeds uh, across a large number of flocks and covering different management um, systems as well. But you can see in the last two years it, it, that 75 or 100 percent isn't quite right. Um, uh, because there were some years which were pulled out because they were um, obviously quite clearly um, uh, too old. But even before up to 10 years old, you can see there's a steady increase in the death rate. Now, I mean, obviously things have changed management um, in, 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 in the intervening period, but the principle is still um, pretty similar. In terms of in, um, uh, in Australia, um, there was um, again, it's it's pretty old data, but um, uh, some uh, up in I think it was uh, this particular uh, trial was run um, in uh, Queensland and uh, northern New South Wales with Helen Newton Turner, um, uh, an eminent geneticist in a time, but um, and, and there were some observations of um, death rates in different age groups and in normal years. Looking at uh, death rates between one and a half to uh, ten and a half years old, the, the average death rate um, of um, uh, uh, use between one and a half and seven and a half was two point two percent, but um, over seven and a half it increased to seven point three percent. In drought years, um, the death rates um, effectively um, doubled, so and one and a half to six year and a half year old use. Um, uh, the average death rate was 3.8 percent, but uh, once um, um, over that time and rapidly increased in pretty much a straight line up to nine years old um, uh, with a 45 uh, percent death rate. So, so uh, realistically you're, you're talking uh, pretty high numbers. In terms of um, um, in terms of um, uh, another uh, data set um, and this was published by Langlands in 84, uh, looking at uh, cumulative mortality rates at two different stocking rates. And so this was 10 sheep and 20 sheep per hectare. And this was part of some stocking rate trials undertaken. And you can, you can see um, that uh, with 10 sheep per hectare, the death rates were um, considerably less than 20 sheep uh, per, per hectare. Although up until about uh, five years of age, there wasn't a lot of difference, but there was a real divergence after that um, uh, period. And you can see once you're up to seven, eight year olds, uh, there was a uh, roughly a, t a 10 to 15 percent um, uh, death rate. So these, these this graph shows a cumulative um, uh, death rate over the life of the sheep. So um, yeah, so I mean clearly that that up to five and six year old, the death rates are pretty modest. Um, over that, that um, it, it starts to uh, rapidly increase. So in terms of um, 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 
uh, just a, a few of the issues working through this is obviously increasing risk as we get older, but there's a, there's a number of different reasons we, we see and, and, and older sheep are particularly vulnerable to um, metabolic problems and particularly hypocalcemia to a lesser degree pregnancy toxemia, but, but um, and, and it's certainly a, an important cause of death in older ewes. And as a general um, principle, um, uh, more handling, uh, any handling in late, late pregnancy increases that risk. And you can, you can have a big impact in reducing that, um, um, the, the losses over that time uh, by just not handling ewes in the last four or five weeks before lambing. So that might mean if uh, ewes need pre-lambing drenches, they have to be done a bit too early uh, in that age group, but uh, younger sheep can certainly be handled closer to lambing, but but certainly the old, older girls, um, uh, uh, that's, it's a really common um, source of loss um, around that, um, uh, and, and in those ewes older than five to six year old in particular. And we, we see um, they're really vulnerable in, 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 in tough years. And you saw with those death rates um, um, from the work in New South Wales um, and also the work from Lang Langlands effectively where there was uh, more pressure put on the sheep that the death rates effectively doubled. But um, this is a classic year um, where in a lot of areas, it's such a wonderful season. Um, ewes are in very fat condition and um, prone to foot abscess. And so um, there's a lot of issues we're seeing at the moment with um, secondary metabolic problems associated with foot abscess or just, um, and a lot of uh, problems primarily with, with, with lambing, not necessarily primary dystochia, but the ewes are just carrying us around so much weight and, and, and losses associated with that. So that's a, that's a really important issue and it's, it's quite noticeable use which have been managed in moderate condition. The death rates are a lot more modest and uh, compared to use which have got over fat, uh, uh, particularly over three and a half. And so older is really vulnerable. I mean, OJD used to be a really big issue, but uh, now a, a rare issue um, due to um, uh, vaccination. But we still see problems in older uh, as ewes get older from time to time in flocks which aren't vaccinated, um, where uh, OJD is just going through that epidemic curve. Um, it's worth making a comment, I, I reckon, with the whole sheep mortality rate in older ewes is, is um, th there's either virtually no or very poor correlation between the dentition and teeth wear and, and production. And that's been shown um, out in a number of trials and some very large trials um, demonstrated that, that point. Um, so a lot of people will call um, um, old, uh, uh, used over five years old based on what the mouth looks like. I mean, I think it's more, far more relevant to focus on other traits, what body weight is compared to the mob condition score and so on, where they've been run under the same conditions. Uh, probably better indicators of, of, um, uh, of picking older ewes, which are starting to be trouble rather than just looking at the teeth. Probably what's more relevant is to look at the molars, but um, well, obviously uh, that, that's, that's not practical. Um, so just looking at the, uh, uh, the incisors, um, is not a, um, a, a good strategy. Um, just a comment with um, 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 crossbred sheep is um, is the um, it's worth mentioning hybrid vigor and um, the, the traits which are, have got the lowest heritability and, and one of them is a lot longevity. Um, another one's fertility and and. And, and, and so on. But uh, the, the, the traits with, which have low heritability, often uh, they uh, benefit most from hybrid vigor. And um, depending on which paper you look at um, in terms of what, what impact this is, but it, it, it's conceivable that that longevity is contributed um, uh, uh, to um, an extra uh, year of life. And we certainly see that in reality, crossbred sheep can uh, certainly um, are more productive for a longer period of time compared to straight um, uh, straight breeds, whether it be merinos or, or some of the uh, pure prime lamb type breeds. But certainly um, uh, the, the crossbred types and, and some of the composites also um, or composites also go in that basket, um, um, it, it, particularly where that 
uh, uh, crossbreeding uh, component of the composite composite is is maintained, um, that there is a benefit for longevity, getting an extra year or two out of the sheep quite comfortably. So um, age impact on um, pre-joining body weight and, and condition score. Um, now, uh, this is um, all information I have um, pulled from a recent um, Sheep Genetics Australia uh, presentation. Uh, which which provided some really interesting information um, on the impact of age on the different traits. But here's um, um, uh, the age impact, and where peak weight tends to be um, uh, between five to seven years old in merinos. Um, interestingly, maternal breeds tend to their peak weight um, tends to be um, a year or so earlier, and. This graph also has um, condition score, but um, you can hardly see it. it. There's just not enough data in there at this stage to make some the comprehensive observations. But I have got um, the condition score uh, data in relation to UH for maternal use. And um, you can see um, compared to the weight in Merinos was peaking at uh, five to seven, the condition score tends to peak at between uh, four to six. Um, years old and then steadily um, uh, uh, steadily drops off from that point point in time. The wool traits um, is um, um, it, things are peaking a little bit earlier than, than body weight and condition score. And if we look at clean fleece weight, and this is some data from um, um, a, a couple of different um, sources. Uh, 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 back in the 60s and also uh, in 2007, uh, there's some uh, data published. And you can see um, the purple line re uh, relates to uh, females, uh, the red line relates to rams, uh, where wool production peaks. Um, uh, and it, it, it tends to peak at three to four years of age, um, uh, wool production, and then um, then steadily drops off. Um, in the blue line, which is mixed sex, um, uh, it's it's uh, uh, tends it, that was a more recent uh, study. It tended to drop off a bit more. Um, the yield is pretty flat, but there is a ten once they get over seven years old. And this data was just up to seven years old. One of the problems with this, the data we have, there's not much data once they get over seven years old. Um, but but certainly. Um, uh, it's pretty flat yield, but there is a little bit in impact. Uh, yield tends to um, uh, reduce and, and use over seven years old as well. I'll show you that in a minute. So, with regard to um, impact of uh, age on uh, fibre diameter, uh, no surprise there that um, as the sheep the sheep get older, then this is all merino data I'm showing you here uh, from the same data sets. Um, the um, uh, fibre diameter tends to um, steadily increase um, uh, over time, but once you get over six years old, it actually starts to drop off. The coefficient of variation of fibre diameter tends to be the lowest at four to five, and then you know, start to increase again. But it's it's uh, it's it's sort of um, no, but certainly fibre diameter it, it steadily increases, and then uh, once you get to six years old, it just starts to drop off a little bit. So this is an older data set from from Queensland, but this uh, just a couple of things here, just showing that yield. Where um, not not a big issue, uh, but see once they get over about um, six and uh, seven year old, it it, it it starts to drop off. Fibre diameter, likewise, once they get over uh, the peak is about six, um, six year old, and then it starts to steadily drop off. And that, the, these are just deviations from the average. Um, and the staple length too, as um, age increases, tends, the staple tends to get shorter. So um, that's um, the, the wool characteristics. Uh, impact of um, age on um, reproduction. Um, I, I guess the reproduction tends to peak between four and six years old, but there's a sub, couple of different traits which tend to make up um, 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 the whole reproduction package, and 
and the, the brown line at the top there uh, shows that the litter size actually uh, tends to steadily increase up to six and flatten six and seven. Uh, and that's certainly in, in, in reality, you see uh, older ewes get um, uh, high, high, um, high litter sizes um, compared to younger, you know, younger users, but, um, but the lambs um, born and the lambs weaned to use joins tends to peak at about that um, uh, between four and six years old. Um, and so um, there's, there's a couple of reasons for that. And, um, and this is just back to the, uh, the, the Sheep uh, Genetics Australia data. And this is showing the different um, reproductive traits between uh, three and, and nine years old. And this is uh, with Merino um, use. Um, the litter size um, it, it, in this data set was peaking at, um, at, at six to seven, but it was still uh, maintained pretty high levels up to uh, nine years of age, uh, interestingly. Uh, conception rates um, tended to peak a bit younger and then steadily declined. And um, also the ewe rearing ability um, is, uh, starts to decline in eight and nine year old ewes as well. So all, all those traits combine um, to uh, mean that um, the um, the whole fertility uh, package tenders, tends to peak between four and six, but it's still pretty reasonable in older use. And that's one of the reasons it produces uh, run older use. Um, also, it's not, a, it's not only the direct impact on um, uh, the, uh, the sheep over its life, but also their progeny. And this is some of the uh, different traits looking at uh, different age of use and the, uh, what impact it has on, on the lambs, um, the weight, um, uh, there's eye muscle uh, depth tends to drop off. And I think those PSC and YSC, I think they're uh, scrotal circumference, but they tend to drop off a bit with age too. So, um, so younger ewes um, uh, 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 producing, tend to be producing the more, more productive uh, traits and so on. Uh, in in the when we're looking at the progeny there, so combining all all uh, that um, together, there's I've looked at a few different ways, and this um, is a the output of a, a model which looking at age structure and profitability. Now I have uh, looked at different age of um, uh, you uh, sale and different age of weather sale. Um, and I've looked at current wool prices with moderate stock uh, prices. So where you're talking sort of 100 to $120 for um, surplus sheep. And then, um, then you've got the current wool prices with high stock prices. So what, what's just happened um, pretty pretty recently. I also looked with higher wool prices and lower wool prices with the different rating of uh, different um, uh, and under different commodity price scenarios and didn't make a massive difference. And you can see, look, um, if we look at um, um, selling um, use um, um, as age, um, as they uh, get older um, at, at sale time, the and this is a gross margin per hectare with a 12 uh, DSC uh, per hectare stocking rate and uh, typical uh, farm costs. Um, and obviously with um, selling weathers at a younger age, we've got a higher proportion of use in the flock and, and, and so on. But you can see uh, sort of there there is yeah, once you get to over seven-year-olds, the um, uh, the gross margin per hectare tends to uh, drop off. Um, um, likewise, with uh, current wool prices, with high stock prices, there's a drop off. Um, not quite so dramatic, but um, but there still is um, a drop off. It's 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 um, and if we look as um, if we're keeping weathers to um, uh, more weathers, the profitability it tends to drop off, particularly um, um, uh, uh, where 
if we've got high stock prices. But again, it, it's it's not a massive difference. It starts to, I mean, with the weather, there's not a big big difference. Uh, say if we're selling, um, uh, keeping used to six and a half, uh, the 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 optimum um, age of uh, weather is um, uh, is selling them at, at well apart from the lamb is is selling them at two and a half, but they're pretty much a flat line. But then it starts to drop off uh, from there, and and this was all modelled with those modelled with the different mortality rate scenarios, uh, different wool production um, and reproductive. Um, scenarios with uh, different age of sheep so it, it, it sort of yeah there is differences they're they're not massive unless you get a really old um old, old flock, flock flock structure the sort of thing where it can start to make quite quite serious impacts but it depends of course on on your your, your stock sale prices as well so Look, in the same sort of pattern, uh, it didn't make a massive difference with uh, lower wool pr prices and higher stock prices or higher wool prices and lower stock prices. I mean, the higher wool prices, more weathers uh, uh, look, looked a bit better and so on. Um, so anyway, um, then I looked at um, a, a scenario of keeping um, a, a few different um, age structures say so selling news at five year old six year old and seven uh seven year old um and and so um so we can see um we've got roughly the same number of views here so 5200 or 5300 pretty much across the board um and i've i've, I've uh the a standard death rate of four percent for two year old four and a half for three five percent for four-year-old, six percent for five-year-old, eight percent for six-year-old and ten percent for seven-year-old. You can um, um, and so following those trends probably re there's more variability about that seven-year-old with good and bad years I guess but you can see with that scenario if we're running um, use up to seven years old our death rate compared to five-year-old our average mortality rate in the use goes from 4.8 percent to 6.1 percent um and um and, and what actually happens the the gross margin um drops by roughly um a dollar per dsc with that 1.3 um, uh, uh, percent drop in average mortality rate even though we've got a group of sheep which is um we've got a high death rate it, it the marginal um um uh reduction in, in gross uh, margin right across the board isn't isn't um, as uh, serious, but the sensitivity. I mean, for every one percent increase in in mortality rate, um, if we're selling news for a hundred dollars, um, it's dropping your um, gross margin by eighty four cents a DSC. And if we're selling news for two hundred dollars, then it's a dollar forty nine per DSC um, reduction. But obviously, the the marginal um, uh, uh, drop in mortality, uh, uh, increase in mortality rates specifically for those seven-year-old ewes is it's a less profitable um, unit of sheep per se. So if we if we look at uh, terminal ewes, I mean obviously you you balance those age-related traits. There's arguments that have uh, more older ewes and less younger uh, younger ewes, and it's, it's certainly an issue we see in uh, particularly with that reproduction thing with having a, a big uh, proportion of um, ewe lambs it, it does whilst uh, you haven't got the depreciate the capital cost of purchasing um, you do miss out in in, in productivity with those uh, a, a reasonable proportion of um, ewe lambs in, in your enterprise but here's a scenario just with um, you've got a buy price of uh, $200 and a sell price of $100 for um, uh, your use if you're keeping them for five years um, uh, then the, your gross margin is um, um, uh, 51 um, and if you keep them for seven years uh, the gross margin is 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 54 dollars a DSC if the mortality rates um, four percent it's 52 if it's six percent it's fifty dollars a DSC um, obviously, if we've got buying news for a higher price, um, usually selling them for a higher price, 
Uh, so you might have $150 depreciation, obviously keeping them for a longer period of time um, over seven years compared to five years is roughly a $4 the difference in the gross margin per DSE. And uh, you're also, you're, you're, your difference in uh, you've got a bigger impact with mortality rate with with high high prices and more depreciation as well. So all, all those factors um, are important to consider um, in 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 your prime land enterprise. I, I, when I was looking uh, around for data with um, age and impact on um, sheep flocks, it was a, I came across an interesting model. Um, uh, which was published in Ag Systems uh, just uh, last year, looking at a prime lamb flock, um, a self-replacing prime lamb flock. Um, uh, and, and what they were looking at specifically was different wastage rates. Now, wastage uh, is a com combination of uh, death rate and, and culling um, uh, uh, different, uh, 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 a few years from each, each, each category, but if, um, you can see, and this was a flock. It only it would have been interesting to run them for a year or two older too, but they they didn't in the model. But I thought it was interesting to uh, relate um, to as you have a higher wastage rate, so a higher mortality rate, um, and uh, and a, might might be a higher culling rate, say selling your um, uh, your uh, dry use and so on. The um, the um, proportion of um, young sheep. In the flock steadily increases, which makes sense. You've got if you're more tipping out, there's more got to go in, and there's less um, older sheep in the system. So more younger sheep, more older, uh, less older sheep with with higher mortality rate and higher culling. So um, so what actually is the impact in this? Is that uh, the lambs uh, uh, when lambs sold um, um, actually um, uh, steadily. Uh, drops um, and uh, the number of replacements is higher, and uh, the, the, so the proportion uh, 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 kept is is steadily higher as the more, uh, the wastage rate goes up. Remember that's a combination of uh, culling and, um, and and mortality. So in in the overall picture. Um, with regard to income and expenses, um, um, is that um, and, and also on the, that's the income expenses on the left hand and cash operating surplus on the right hand. And this was effectively for a 2000 new flock, and it was modelled um, uh, on 2015 prices in New, in New Zealand, so significantly below where they are now. But you can see uh, the costs. Uh, pretty much flat line, didn't make a big difference. The income from sheep sales uh, drops, um, uh, total income drops, um, and the, the dark line is the cash operating surplus um, steadily declines um, with a high mortality rate and high culling percentage. And the reason, the primary driver of this is that there's less wetlands wean per year because you've got more um, young uh, young use in the system and meat production is reduced, wool production has increased a little bit, but it doesn't turn the dial being broad wool. Um, so roughly, I mean, for every 1% less wastage, there was a $1,000 um, um, per, which is about 2.5% two, two if we, 2-2.5% uh, two, two to two of the total cash operating surf, uh, surplus for every 1% less wastage. So I, I guess, um, uh, in conclusion, I mean, look, old ewes, I mean, look, um, they are less productive, um, but the reality is um, it, it, it doesn't make, it won't make in the overall scheme of things a massive difference to profitability. And there's real logical reasons from a biosecurity point of view to keep them. Um, but you need, there is a balance there with keeping too many old ewes in terms of with high, if you're not managing those death rates well. And so just remember for every 1% um, high death rate in the cohort, there's a um, effectively close to a dollar of DSE, your gross margin's dropping. So um, keeping too many old years with high death rates is gonna really impact, will impact on your profit. Uh, but there's reasons to do them for short-term strategies, drought recovery, um, 
um, buying an, uh, another block of land or leasing a block of land and, 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 and to expanding your enterprise. But I mean, look, it's really a balance with the with the production traits. Reproduction is still pretty good up to quite an old age, but the wool traits um, are more heavily discounted uh, and death rates invariably do increase um, for a whole plethora of reasons, particularly the metabolic issues that are high on the agenda. Um, the impact is, is realistically moderate uh, by having older ewes. Uh, so you need to consider all those factors in there. So look, that, that's enough. Um, if, if there's any questions, perhaps Hillary will we'll, um, uh, start, start talking. Fantastic. Thanks so much for that, John. And I um, really particularly enjoyed the slide you threw in early on about how many use you can make to terminals because I think um, those who have a merino and a maybe a dual purpose system might have thought about that the way that the wool market's gone this year. So um, great job. Thank you for that presentation. So I will just give John a little bit of a break um, while I, if you do, sorry, if you do have to head off early, um, there will be a, web, a survey that pops up as you exit the webinar. If you could take uh, two or three minutes just to answer this survey, um, it goes back to MLA, uh, the facilitators at Home Sacket and the presenters like John, just to make sure that these presentations are uh, hitting the right areas and as I said at the beginning of this webinar uh, this is the last uh, webinar for this series but we will be back later on the year uh, you can take that time to revisit the last 30 webinars which are on the MLA website all right we'll, we'll get started with some of the questions um, John so the first one for from Ryan uh, how do crossbreds compare for reproduction traits with age look it, it's um, the, the, I, I couldn't find a really good data on it um, but I, I think with the um, the, the reproductive, given the longevity, particularly with a crossbred, uh, it is it, it is um, um, uh, uh, it is okay in terms. They probably don't drop off quite as much, but um, but interestingly, in contrast, the the, the body weight of the maternals dropped off uh, a year before the merinos. But I don't think. That necessarily reflects in, in the crossbred use with the hybrid vigor in there. So um, I, I think certainly it does drop off. There's absolutely no doubt it all drops off. And if if you think, I mean, the litter size is still pretty good in old ewes. You get lots of um, um, uh, twins and so on. And, and but the reality is with those um, old ewes, I think the the things which hurts it to some degree is the, the rear inability of those older ewes. And there's all sorts of other things which come into play, um, which aren't high in the radar, but but um, then it's a really interesting issue, and it's actually quite a costly one for the industry. Is things like mastitis and um, um, with old, it, it, there's a higher risk with older sheep. There's no doubt about that, but um, um, uh, and I'm sure most producers have seen, seen things like uh, where they get used with hard adder with just no milk and they've, they've, they've got um, a ewe standing above dead twin lambs and you you think why did they die and you catch the ewe and it's just got no milk and it's by mastitis and the risk of that increases with age and and is, is likely to be repeatable between years two to some degree and so um, Things like that come into play as well, but certainly, um, as you can see, the rearing ability does drop off with those uh, older ewes. And I think it, the other thing I reckon is as much as, um, and my observations travelling across the country, there's some areas where um, I, I think I think it's in the some of the higher rainfall country you see where you've got a pretty um, nice growing season and you haven't got the harsh differences between uh, really hot, dry summer and um, um, really miserable winters. It, 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 in, in that sort of scenario, often we see ewes um, running to an, a, a older age compared to uh, when things are tough. And I guess when you look at that that stocking rate 
scenario, the death rates would double in, in, in that uh, trial where there are 20 sheep per hectare compared to 10 sheep per hectare. So yeah, no, look, they're all, all uh, important uh, important points, but certainly the, the, the reproductive in, impact, and I think it varies between some of the prime lambs too, but the prime lamb breeds too, but there's not a huge amount of data on, on that area. I mean, most of the data was was relating to um, merinos, uh, but crossbreds. Some um, the, you, you have got that hybrid vigor benefit um, adding to the longevity of the sheep. Fantastic, thank you. Uh, the next question from Ruth: Does concentrating on providing calcium and magnesium help with feed prior to lambing? Look, I, I think it's more complicated. Um, uh, than that, it, it's funnily in, in in cows, it's a, a big risk factor with hypocalcemia is feeding them calcium in late pregnancy, but it is quite different in, in use in terms of the risk of hypocalcemia as pre lambing rather than post lambing, and and um, and and there's work to be done on that, and 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 including um, some of the risk is set um, if, if if those older ewes um, were um, uh, had a really tough time as a young sheep um, and young grown sheep, particularly they grew up in a drought. Now there's two types of bone, there's the, the long bone and there's a the trabecular bone and often um, sheep which have grown up in a drought have had osteoporosis as a young lamb and that's when they get um, trabecular bone development. So that woven bone, if you see, if you look at a long bone, you'll see it at the ends, particularly at the end, each end of the bone. but but often um, ewes which have had a tough life as a younger sheep haven't, it's got much trabecular bone and so they've got less resources to, to uh, pull on and in, in later, um, uh, later life when, when they become particularly at risk and the demand and, the, uh, and, and what um, is high in those old ewes um, and, and they just haven't got the resources. So, I mean, it, it's sort of, it's a bit more complicated than just providing calcium, uh, I think, because I see people do that and don't have a good response and others uh, don't do anything and don't have uh, many problems. But I think one, one thing they do, it's, it's, it's not about just providing late pregnancy, it's, it's about um, good nutrition over the summer in particular. And I mean, there's no doubt we, we, we recommend when you're, when you're providing grain, which is uh, lowering calcium to to provide you know, one one half percent um, limestone um, when when you're heavily uh, grain feeding for an extended period of time, um, but once they get to um, late uh, later lactation in spring, that's when they really put the reserves back in their bones. So so it's really the whole nutrition thing is important at that stage right the way through. But it's not just thinking about it in the last um, last. Um, sort of month before lambing, the horse has bolted somewhat. But also, the dial, uh, the, they, they might be higher risk if, if those sheep um, suffered nutritionally as a young sheep. And it's not only just about um, uh, calcium as a young sheep. Um, if, they're, if they're deficient in protein um, and, and, and poorly grown, uh, that, that will lock in poorer bone developers, the young sheep, and they don't rebuild that bone as an older animal. There you go. How interesting. That's fascinating. All right. Um, Bruce has written in great job, great job, angry. So thanks for listening, Bruce. Um, the next question from Emma. As ewes age, is there a significant difference between live joining and AI in terms of ewe longevity and fertility? So just get repeat that again. Is there a, um, a difference between is there a AI and live joining in terms of you longevity and fertility? It's a bit of a I'm not sure how to interpret that one. We might just maybe come back to that one. Um, the next one from Colin: Does worm resilience drop off with age? And if yes, what is the what age does this start? Look, I, I think they are a higher risk cohort, uh, older sheep. 
and, and I, I tend to take a more conservative approach with worm control with ewes over uh, six years old. I think young maiden ewes are at risk, uh, but it really comes down to um, nutritional management too, and overall strategic worm control. It's no doubt, I, th I think, and you, 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 if you've got um, good nutrition, um, it does have a massive impact into management of worms. Now, that's, I mean, obviously with stocking rate and all that sort of stuff, the, there's always, uh, it's a fine line there. Um, and, and having fat ewes with no worms is not going to help in the long, long haul either. But I, th I think as a general principle, the younger stage group of ewes are most uh, at risk, but I also consider older ewes and I usually Observationally, I reckon over six-year-old, they um, they're more at risk, and I think it, it goes for uh, a lot of different um, um, diseases, but um, uh, as well. So I do take a more conservative approach with with with, with my worm control with those older older ewes, and and you also see it in beef cattle as well. You see in middle-aged cows, you don't see much type two osteotagia unless there's some underlying issue there, but you see it you're more likely to see it pop up in the older, older, um, older age group. And I think the same principle with, with, with um, worm control as well. But, and I think because they're lighter, I mean, whole, the whole nutritional thing, um, the lighter body weight, um, uh, they're more, but they are more vulnerable cohort. There's no doubt about that. Thank you. Uh, just on that previous question, someone, oh, Bruce is, um, he's on the ball. Uh, how does AI versus natural joining impact on you fertility? Um, look, AI, um, it, it generally, um, I, I expect um, conception rates to AI are lower. Um, I'm, I'm no expert on AI in, um, in, in sheep, so I'm not the best person to answer that question. But as a general principle, um, the, um, um, and if you, uh, if you think about it, um, the, um, just back to that slide um, where we had um, the conception rate, you can see, um, if we're talking age age of um, sheep, the, the the conception rates peak at four and five. So if you're doing an expensive AI program, um, then um, the older ewes um, are perhaps going to give you a more expensive lamb because the conception rate is a little bit lower, and the rearing ability of those lambs too. But also the other thing you've got to ask the question from a genetic improvement um, too is is um, flogging a dead horse with old, really old ewes, um, uh, which have passed, had ample opportunity to pass on their um, uh, good genetics. Uh, um, theoretically, if your genetic improvement program is is reasonable, you should you you, you and again it's that generate one of the fundamental factors which um, um, uh, drives uh, genetic impro improvement is generation interval and. Um, selection intensity. So um, I'd, I'd be looking at that from those point of view rather than uh, uh, to, to do, focus on uh, um, uh, AI rather than uh, the really old ones. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I mean, I know some people do have, uh, do select for um, uh, older use and all that sort of stuff, but I, I think it's probably the heritability of that from my understanding is, is, of, uh, is very, very low. So, and that's one of the reasons why with crossbreds longevity is is um, one of the things which benefits out of hybrid vigor. It, it's uh, survive, lamb survival and and um, and um, uh, and longevity. Excellent, thanks. Things which are pretty low heritability. Yep. Great, thank you, John. Uh, from Emma, are there any minerals or supplements that assist older ewes in maintaining? Uh, these important qualities. <laughs> um, if you can comment on any minerals and supplements that assist older use, that'd be great. Look, look the only one, um, I mean, look, if you're deficient in trace elements, then you need to supplement accordingly, whether it be selenium, uh, uh, B12, copper or whatever. 
So that's across the board, not only just older sheep, it's more what the type of country they're on. And that understanding the underlying deficiencies is where I'd, I'd tackle it head on there. And remembering that younger sheep are generally most at risk of those sort of trace nutrient deficiencies. With regard to uh, the macro type uh, minerals, um, obviously um, your, your calcium um, is, is your big one. Sheep, magnesium is not as big big in sheep. It's, uh, there seems to be a hell of a lot of supplements going out there with magnesium, and I understand for uh, for uh, for there's there's growth responses on uh, grazing cereals with with magnesium as well as uh, calcium and all that sort of stuff. But it, it comes down to calcium. I guess just one thing with that hypocalcemia, which we need a bit to get a better grip of, is is providing anionic salts to basically acidify the um, make the animal less alkaline and how that's measured if you measure the urine pH and I know in, in cows that it can be up at a urine pH of nine and give, give them a bit of roughage and it'll drop down to seven and, and so when it's more acidic their, their body's more slightly more acidic they can actually resort more calcium off the bones and I know there is some um, uh, pellets which are provided um, pre uh, can be given pre lambing, which have got anionic salts, and they they do help acidify the animal a bit better than um, um, other other things, and and uh, perhaps help that um, the use ability to draw calcium um, off off their bones. So that's that's sort of one one area which I think we need we need to do a little bit more work on that. I reckon to really understand. There's some good work done in the 80s and early 90s um, with with understanding um, that calcium metabolize, uh, metabolism, uh, a few PhD students at, um, at McKinnon, which did some more work, but it hasn't hasn't really been followed on uh, from there just to get the, get the full understanding of, of, of some of that uh, stuff in, in use um, where it's particularly uh, understood very well in, in beef cattle uh, which, with different mechanisms. Okay. But I, I wouldn't be getting distracted with other um, minerals to solve all problems of the world. Excellent. I think they're doing some work at CSU at the moment on that stuff. So, yeah. <laughs> well, Bruce asked me to promo it. So, there you go, Bruce. <laughs> Sorry, throwing money at us. <laughs> All right. Uh, from Frank, um, are you aware of hair breeds um, increasing lambing percentage of older ewes? I haven't. Um, I, I, it's one thing I it went through to the keeper. I apologise about that. Um, I didn't. I, I um, can't really comment. But I wonder whether a pure purebred there. Um, um, if they're a purebred, then I'd be suspicious. Say the longevity wouldn't be quite as good as a crossbred type sheep. But I, um, I, I just don't know. Excellent. That's okay. All right, the next one, This um, I'll say it slowly so we get the full question. Uh, moving away from merinos, if you retain the top 20% of your ewe lambs and cull 20% of your least productive older ewes and use better genetics, more suited to your landscape and environment, surely your cumulative improvement in your flock is greater. Look, it's it's an interesting one, and and I'd emphasise the point of how successfully you um, manage the um, ewe lambs in a in a if you've got a self-replacing maternal flock, um, and in the areas which I uh, work, we just can't do that with the merinos, the the ewe lamb sort of thing, but. Um, that's fine, but but with the um, maternal flocks, um, yeah, that's there is a point there. It's a it's a matter of your um, accuracy, of your selection of um, the um, the middle age poor performing ewes and so on um, is is one thing. Um, the, and and look over time, there's one wonderful thing about um, genetic improvement. It's 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 um, uh, cumulative and p permanent. So 
you, you can uh, over time obviously make real inroads, but being mindful that you need to be patient with the reproductive traits because their heritability is is, is pretty low. Um, and obviously you've got to be balanced with other traits. The thing which I've found, and, and, and I don't think it's nearly the issue up further north, but particularly in Southern areas, say like Western Victoria or a lot of Southern Victoria, the, the ability to grow out that ewe lamb to join, it's quite an expensive exercise now. Um, and, and then the reproductive performance is, is pretty disappointing. And I, I noticed a huge difference in success between Southern Victoria and the Northern Victoria, particularly where the stocking rates on the farm are pretty, pretty high. And, and and the impact on on that um, uh, in terms of productivity, and that was demonstrated in that um, model from uh, which uh, of that New Zealand flock, which was uh, I, I found quite intriguing. But I mean, insane small incremental gains with genetic improvement with um, uh, your, your selected traits, um, uh, particularly where you've got a closed flock um, uh, are re really, really valuable over time. So there's a balance there. I think you've got to look where your flock is now and the impact and, and some flocks, the, the cost of going down that path are quite high compared to uh, the flocks which can do it quite successfully and it, it's, it's, it, it works really well. So I think you've got to look at the, the place where you are on, on your, um, um, uh, with your current before you jump in and assume that uh, what you do on one place is going to be right on all places. That certainly isn't the case all the time. Mm. And, and particularly where you're pushing the envelope, it's sort of, it's a real cost. But I mean, you've got to balance that too with those uh, really important issues. You've got control of your genetic improvement. You've got control of you're taking up that price risk and importantly, that disease risk. Great. Thank you for answering that, John. Good question. Uh, okay, I've got the last one here from David. So if you do have one more to get in, uh, get it in quickly. Um, John, would you care to comment on the values of older ewes? The values of older ewes? Yeah, so I, I assume that's the purchase values. Yeah, it's a... Um, I look... I, I I would sit down with, and there's so many different scenarios and I was going to play around with that for this talk, the thought. It, it's sort of, you just catch one point in time. It's pro, it's more about the, the principle. So um, obviously if, if you're buying old old um, ewes, they, they've got a, a, a productive value. There's no doubt about that. But I would immediately be looking, well, what happens if we buy ewes for a little bit more, a little bit younger? And we don't have as high a turnaround. But if, if you've also, on the other side of that equation, you've got to think, well, look, if our existing flock were building up numbers anyway, and we're going to be right in two years, we only need those stock for two years. Well, you might be better off with the cheaper older one to, to get through there. But by all means, I, I tend to factor in much higher mortality rates with my um, budgeting with those older years, and the evidence is quite clear, the, the old, uh, old ewes have high, high death rates. Um, um, and if, if it's a 10% death rate for an eight year old ewe, well, I mean, I reckon I'd put that in every day of the week. So then the younger one might be a bit more expensive, but you've got it for another couple of years too. So your depreciation, you can halve over two years rather than just that really old one year you. So look, it's a matter of doing the sums with every, every scenario and it's changing all the time. I mean, prices, um, what they were spectacularly high for the lucky person over in the York Peninsula last week or whatever it was, but um, good luck to them. But I'd, I'd be, um, and the uh, people that bought it might, might do well at them, but uh, I'd, I'd be doing the sums all the time. Things are changing all the time. Um, with regard to store prices, and uh, sometimes old ewes make sense, and sometimes young ewes, younger ewes, which cost more, make sense. And so, uh, yeah, it's a very fluid market, and I think every time you look, you just look at what's what's going to be the best value and do it at that basis. Okay. Absolutely, and Dave's just made the point as well that they're very hard to sell after 
seven and a half years in pastoral areas. Uh, so that's just another factor as well. Well, I mean, once you get over yeah, eight year old, I mean, let's face it. I mean, they they they've got a they they've got their mutton value, haven't they? Mm. That's true. All right, that's all for the questions. So thank you very very much, John, for jumping on tonight and giving that us that really great presentation. Um, thank you for everyone uh, who attended. Um, again, this is our final webinar for this series, but we will be back um, in a few months. So watch out for the emails. I'm sure you won't miss them. Um, so thanks again, John, and good night, everyone. Thanks.